Okay, so um, we're going to talk about Jonah. I know it's not exactly the appropriate calendar time. However, uh, Jonah is really a very interesting character. And what I would like to do tonight is to uh, raise a number of questions about Jonah, um, when the book was written, uh, when it, uh, how it became a Haftorah for Yom Kippur Mincha time, what are some of the, the issues around Jonah, and, and why is it important? And the reason I want to do this is because I think that Jonah's introduction into the Machzor, into the High Holiday Prayer Book for Yom Kippur, marks a major turning point, a keystone in the development of modern Jewish life. And it, somehow I, I just don't think it's given that kind of credibility. So a little background. Uh, what I, oh, just uh, guidelines. So if you have any questions, I want you to feel free to interrupt me just by raising your hand. Alan will um, unmute you. I'll do the best to answer. If I can't do it right away, then we'll take it at the end of the session. Uh, our Bible contains 15 prophetic books. But um, surprisingly, Muhammad speaks only of Jonah. And, and it refers to him as him of the fish. As early as the second century, the stories of Daniel's in the lion's den um, and Jonah in the belly of the fish were understood in the eyes of Christians as a prefiguring of the resurrection. After all, if you're swallowed into a fish and you're kicked up back onto dry land, you've been, you've been re reborn. The challenge for us is to ferret out the original meaning of the text and ask, what does it mean for, for we moderns? Now, I know you, most of you know the story. The story of Jonah has three characters, God, Jonah, and the people of Nineveh. Jonah, like Moses, um, oh, Alan, somebody said the wrong link was sent out. Um, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, all right, Jonah, like, 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 I can't answer him. I'm talking to you. Um, Jonah, like Moses, was reluctant to accept a divine call. And the author, or the authors of this story, use this theme to build suspense. So when we think of Jonah, we have to think of it as a, a literary fiction, a story that the authors used to create or to some kind of suspense and to some kind of a message. Now, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, which is a city uh, near the site of today's uh, Mosul in Iraq. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which was viewed by the rabbis like Rome was in rabbinic times. In other words, the rabbis looked at Nineveh as sin city, okay? But instead, what did he do? He fled to Tarshish. Most of you know the story, a storm, a confession, cast into the sea and swallowed by a, a big fish where he stayed for three days. And when inside of the fish, he prayed and was saved and was vomited up onto dry land. Now the church fathers, we're talking about people who lived in the, let's say the second, third and fourth century CE, okay, um, they lived in a very polytheistic world, and they used this story to counter some basic myths from other gods, plural. Because you see, if you read the story of Hercules, Hercules um, was swallowed by a great fish, and he fought his way out, and he succeeded in killing the fish. They, ex they explained this to the unbelieving Christians or potential Christians that Hercule, that Jesus didn't have, Jonah didn't have to kill the fish. Jonah was actually saved from drowning. So but the question is, was there really a Jonah? Well, Jonah ben Amitai from, from Gat Hefer in Galilee, according to the, lived during the reign of Jeroboam II. That is, he lived in the middle of the 8th century BCE. That's an important verse to know. His na he's named in the second book of Kings, a chapter, if you want to go to check me, chapter 14, verse 25, as a prophet who foretold the territorial expansion of Israel from the region of Hamath to the Dead Sea. So we know that a man named Jonah actually lived. 
but the book of Jonah reflects a time much, much later. So let me put this into context. Jonah, the book of Jonah was written after the year 612. So 200 years, sometimes 200 years later, when Nineveh, the Assyrian capital was destroyed. We know the book was written under Persian rule. Now, how do we know that? From the language employed, Jonah uses phrases like the edict of, pen of penance for the Ninevites was issued by the king and his grandees. That's chapter three. This is a Persian phrase. It's used in Ezra, it's used in Daniel, and it's used in, in Esther, where Jonah, it says, Jonah worshiped the God of heaven. That was a popular phrase used in the fifth century. The book of Jonah was probably written in the fifth century, sometime around the year, let's just say 400, 450. So wait a second. So Jonah lived in the, around 800, 850. 400 years later, the book was written. Okay, this is important. Now going back to Tarshish, going back to where Jan, J Jonah fled, uh, one wonders, how could he have escaped from the Lord? Now, the traditional explanation was Jonah, being a prophet, knew that in advance that Nineveh would repent and be saved. And that would shame the stiff-necked people of Israel. In other words, if a non-Jewish people could repent, it could make nations think less of Israel. Why? Because of their desecration of Shabbat, their interesting warfare, and their violation of other religious uh, um, activities. Now, the church fathers, again, we're going slipping forward in time, turn this inter interpretation against its authors, stating that Jonah was sent to Nineveh because the Jews refused to listen to the prophets and the book was written to teach a lesson to that stiff-necked people. Wow, that's our Jonah. That's, that's Jew and, and, and non-Jew. This was 800 years later in, uh, in France, David, Rabbi David Kimke of Narbonne, also suggested the book of Jonah was written to, to serve as an example to Israel. But let's look at this from another point of view. Let's get practical. Why would Jonah be hesitant to go to Nineveh? I mean, he had a job, he was a court prophet. Why would he be hesitant to leave the country, travel outside of his country, to leave his, his family and his friends, you know, and to descend into the belly of the beast? Think about it, if a king's prophet left his country and prophesied in another country, first, could he ever return? And second, how would the king in that country where he was prophesying respond to him? Um, if he depleted, if he, he was now, in, he, he knew he would become an exile. And as an exile, he, if he wanted to return, he'd be considered a traitor and risk never seeing his family and friends again. The interpretation of, uh, of the church fathers became very popular after the destruction of the temple in 70 and after the defeat of Bar Kokhba in 135 um, as well. Imagine what our ancestors living in the time of Bar Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba's revolt thought of the story, which had already been placed in the Bible hundreds of years earlier. Rabbi Akiva, who was responsible for um, anointing Bar Kokhba as the Messiah, believe that God spoke as a result of the merits of Israel. If that was the case, Jonah's mission did not make sense. A lot of questions here. So let's return to thinking about the text. Are there any unusual incidents that stand out? Yeah, of course, there's the fish, there's the psalm, and finally, the prophecy. Now, if Jonah lived in the 400s, our tradition tells us that prophecy ended with the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, which was sometime around 500 BCE. Um, so for us, so for the Jewish people, prophecy ended, but not in Greece and not in Rome and not in Persia. They had lots of prophets all over the place, you know, prophesying on the street corners as if it was a Simon and Garfinkel uh, song. So the question is, why was the book of Jonah, who couldn't possibly have been a prophet, included in the books of prophets? And when and how did it get there? While the book of Jonah is included in the prophets, he's not referred to as a prophet. He's referred to as a seer. Um, a seer could see into the future 
but could also suspect that his visions might not be realized. Prophets, apparently, their vision, they, 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 they experienced God through dreams. Seers had visions. I, frankly, I can't explain the difference. But if a seer had a vision and realized what he saw would be altered, he risked being labeled a false prophet. What I'm trying to say is that even though prophecy for us didn't exist in the fifth century BCE, it was rampant in the Persian world. So maybe, just maybe, the biblical story is not about a prophet, but about an unfulfilled prophecy. The graciousness of God explains Jonah's failure. And of course, it raises the question of how can God's words remain unfulfilled? Now, this brings us to the question of the Haftarah for Yom Kippur, but not yet. The question is, can all sins be canceled by repentance, through repentance? After the, temple, the first temple was destroyed in 586 BCE, this was a popular theological motif. We find it on the ninth of Av, which tells us repentance re reinstates the sinner in divine favor. Chashivenu Adonai Alecha, return unto me and I shall return unto you. It's what we sing when we turn the Torah to the ark. But perhaps Jonah didn't agree with this. Now, the compilers of the Tanakh, living between the destruction of the two temples, could have placed the book of Jonah in the Bible in an effort to teach repentance. But why did it become the Haftorah for Yom Kippur? What was the message that it was supposed to teach? And in order to understand that, we need to skip forward to the time just before the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, the time of Yochanan ben Zachai. So let's go back. 850, he lived. 400, 450, the book was written. Around 135, in other words, second century CE, Yochanan ben Zachai is the first rabbi um, appears. Um, I'm assuming most of you, if not, you'll raise your hand, please, knows the story of Yochanan ben Zakkai uh, being smuggled out of Jerusalem uh, to see Vespasian in a, in a coffin. And when he meets Vespasian, he asks if he can establish an academy um, in, in Yavna. Um, and most likely, yeah. so uh, he was challenged to reimagine Jewish life without a temple. Now, and most likely took him some time to establish credibility, but I believe he preached when we pray on Yom Kippur. Teshuva, tefillah, tzedakah, averts the severe, the severe decree. So what's the severe decree? That's the aim, that's the, the, severe, the severe decree was that the sins of the fathers would be transferred to their children. That future descendant of those who sinned, who didn't follow God's law, would inherit the punishment of their parents and grandparents. Haftarot, or readings from the prophet, probably began during Hasmonean times earlier. We know that at least three traditions existed. Um, there was one where um, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms were read kind of like in concentric circles. Uh, we know that there were two in Jerusalem. There was one outside of Jerusalem. Uh, but what's important is that the ha first Haftarot most likely were linked with major festivals. And so it seems logical that Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot most likely had the first Haftarot. Now, I assume and this is my theory, that Yochanan ben Zakkai or his, dis or his disciples were responsible for attaching the book of Jonah to Yom Kippur afternoon. Why? Because at a time when we were repenting, we learned that God could change God's mind. The severe decree could be averted. And that's why I ask you to consider, this is the reason the rabbis determined the book of Jonah belonged in the Yom Kippur service to teach us that repentance, prayer, and good deeds can make a difference. So now you know more about Jonah than all of my colleagues, okay? If there are any questions, I'm, I'm, I wanted to do this in a limited amount of time. Um, now is the time to ask questions. 
<laughs> Alan, you have to unmute people. Michael, the body. You have to unmute, Michael. Everybody's unmuted. Okay. Everyone is unmuted. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Michael, I can't hear you. Did you see now? <laughs> Alan, any help here? I don't know. Mike's not muted. Uh, you're unmuted. Try taking off your earphones. No, try talking into. No good. Better. Okay, you... the next question. We'll come back. Oh wait, now we can hear you, Michael. Try again. All right, you can hear me now. Yes. yes. All right. So, Rabbi, my question is uh, concerning the severe decree. So, in most machzorim that I'm familiar with. The expression is not translated at the Roa Gezira, it's not the severe decree, but God averting the severity of the, decree, of the decree. But you specifically alluded to a specific severe decree. So could it have been that the translation was changed over time? Mavi Yirinek is, is the, the Hebrew is it over, overcomes it, over, you know, it overrules it. So those are the three things which overrule the severe decree. The question is, what was the severe decree? Right. And, and I think the severe decree was that the sins of the fathers will go to their children. This frees us up to have our own lives and to move forward. I hope I that's satisfactory. That, mm -hmm. I always thought the severe decree was death, frankly. Well, I, that hasn't changed much. I mean, I haven't, I'm still <laughs> 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 I don't think severe. that's the case. You know? Norm, did I see your hand up? No, okay. Anybody else? Uh, Mike. Yes, Ruben. Well, then, I guess. Uh, Bob Watts, I thought I had a question. I think Michael Freilich was either he's just talking on the phone or he, he uh... <laughs> he's talking on the phone. I, I muted him for that. Michael, Martin. Marty has a question. A simple question. How did Jonah and the fi great fish, the way we read it, came Jonah and the whale? That's a Christian thing. That when, that's when, um, when the, church, with, the, the church decorated its cathedrals and its churches with visuals, okay, because most of the population was illiterate, and that's the way they learned Bible stories. So the only kind of fish that they can conceive of was a whale. That's how it <laughs> Sound good to me. <laughs> uh, Chuck, I had just read, actually, I read the Wikipedia article on this. Yes. It said that there was a translation issue when I think St. Jerome translated it into Latin from the Greek. He took like a cognate, a, a um, homophone or something like that that wound up being whale in Latin from Greek for fish or something like that. Well, that, that's possible because there were a number of, I'll give you another example for that. Um, in Isaiah chapter six, it talks about um, a young woman of a marriageable age. Um, if you know of Handel, she, a young woman of marriageable age. And the word in the Aramaic is betultata, which means virgin, okay? But there isn't a, a corresponding word in Greek. The corresponding word in Greek is parthenos, um, which, excuse me, I said it backwards. The, the text says virgin. The corresponding word in Greek was parthenos, which is a, a woman of marriageable age. Now, there's a heck of a difference between the two of them. So there were a lot of different, when, when the Bible was translated from its more or less original format, whatever format it was into, into Greek, a lot of words, the, 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 the emphasis changed, the tone changed. Another example would be um, the different names of God. Um, developed, you know, de Elohim, I don't know, et cetera, et cetera, developed into the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, because they had to put some kind of a term to it. Okay. Michael, free look. The oh. Hebrew word that was originally used was almanah, and it occurs seven times in the Tanakh. 
three times it's clearly a virgin, three times it's clearly a woman of marital age. And Isaiah, it's not clear what it is. The Christians interpret it as a precursor to the end of God's going to appear. That was an article that was written in the late 60s, early 60s. And I, I, that was testamentary. Could you repeat that, Alan? I couldn't hear him. I couldn't hear it a lot, too. It was something about uh, the use of that, the phrase that you just talked about, uh, of maritable age, in the early 6th century, 60s. I think you said, Mike? You want me yeah. to try again? Yeah. A little louder. A very metallic sounding. Now you just muted. Uh, but I think what he meant was in the 60s, there was an article about it. 1960s. Yeah, it was an article in Tetris Vestimentum. Yes. And it said there were seven uh, references to the word almana, which is the Hebrew equivalent for what we're talking about. Three cases in the Tanakh, it was clearly referred to a virgin. Three times it was clearly to a girl of marital age. This is the one case in Isaiah when we don't know what it was. Okay. That's a, All right. for, my, for my youth. <laughs> okay. So, Bob, you got some, you've got two answers or two suggestions. That's good. Well, no, it's the same. We're saying the same thing. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Which is not usual. Yeah. <laughs> and from my youth, I remember Her at the Wind, where the, there was a discussion in the show, in the book, book play, whichever you want to call it, about whether it was whale, big fish, or great fish. And that was uh -huh. uh, some argument there. Of course, that was based on the, on the Christian Bible. Right. But I think it's interesting that when Jonah is in the belly of the whatever it was, um, he utters a psalm, which is, it was an addition. It didn't happen right away. I don't think he was that poetic. But um, it's, he's basically, it's a, it's a prayer of love for God. It's not, it's, you know, it's, that's really what it is. And after his prayer of, of, of affection and of love, not necessarily deliverance, he's vomited forth onto, onto dry land. So... Um, now you're all um, scholars of Jonah. Well, so oh, Norm has a question. Yes? Yeah, so it made me think, did I hear you right that it was written around 400 CE? Jonah? Um, no, Jonah was written probably around 400 BCE. Ah, okay. Now it makes more sense. Thank okay. you. Okay, so that's the, 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 linear, the linear time was 850 BCE, 400, and then by right. the time we get to the Haptarot, we're talking 600 years later. That's, that's why it was mixed up for me. I got it. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. So, um, yes, uh, Randy. Yep. Hi, Rabbi, I just wanted to ask, you may have said it, I may have missed it. I know you did mention that, like most of the stories, <laughs> they're to teach a lesson, but how did this particular lesson just happen to wind up on the last day of the high holidays? Okay, so here's my take on this. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, I mentioned that when the Haftarot began to be um, linked with the Torah portion, or they, it, it happened first because they were different. You know, they linked it with holy days because they were the most observed. Now, and there are different levels of when the Haftarot went on. For example, we always between. Um, we have the, you know, the three weeks before Tisha B'Av, the seven weeks before Tisha B'Av. There's a 10 Haftarot, but they had a, that's an overlay. It had to replace something else because um, Haftarot were around for a couple hundred years before that. So there were the Haftarot, and, and of course, um, there are different traditions of Haftarot, where like Sephardim and Greek Jews have different, read different Haftarot in certain times, as opposed to Ashkenazim. But um, what we're pretty much clear on is that the initial Haftarot that were read corresponded with important events. So the question is, what would they, okay, we're now reading from the, you have to understand that our ancestors were looking to the Haftarot for guidance. Okay, I mean, after the temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed, our ancestors looked to the wisdom of the, of the prophets, those are for how did they handle the destruction of the first temple? Okay, this is, you know, that's where the wisdom came from. Um, and eventually, I think one of the reasons why Haftarot developed the way they did was because it was a tool for education. But I think that's gotten lost in, in modern, modern Jewish life today. But because it's a great opportunity to teach people that historical periods. 
But so I think Yom Kippur was probably one of the first. And living in, I don't know, the year 200, 300, you know, CE, after, you know, when, when our, without a temple, when our liturgy was, you know, after, when we're still grieving, oh, here's a great example. So, you know, when we uh, say the blessings um, after the, before and after the Haftarah, <clears throat> there, there, there's one blessing that starts with the word Samchenu in our joy. The original form of that blessing was Chachoteinu in our, in our sins, from our sins. These pe- uh, the people who, who created those blessings were still living in the aftermath of the destruction of the Second Temple, and they felt responsible. And it was a huge shift to go from we're guilty to we could experience joy. Okay, so that's... Yeah, that makes sense. sense. <laughs> that's great. Okay, okay so um, I wish you all a great summer, and thank you for being on this session. I think it was recorded, if you want notes. Yes. Anybody has questions, they can always call me. And um, hope to see you all again sometime in the future. Thank you very much, Rabbi Simon. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all. Thank you, Chuck. Please stay safe and healthy. Michael, I can finally see you. To everyone. Take care. Okay.